which we shall begin. This is a special evening for all of us. We have new teachers who have been diligently working on research projects in their classroom. And they couldn't believe that they actually turned into researchers. And they've worked on a challenge in their room. And they did it by taking teacher standards, choosing two or three teacher standards, applying it to themselves, and then taking the concepts of what they wanted to develop in themselves and applying it to the classroom and to a challenge in the classroom using some of the researchers that we were discussing. And I have to say, I'm just so delighted that so many of our um, previous cohorts are here. And I'm going to go around and ask you all to introduce yourselves. But this, and I love all of them, but this particular cohort came together very quickly. I don't know why, but we, as you know, I always stress building community in your classrooms as a classroom teacher. And they came together as a community much quicker. And I knew that that was happening because they began to laugh with one another. And if you recall, one day I was with them and I said, do you know you're laughing? Which was a big change from the way they began. Because when they began, they was like, oh my God, how are we going to get through the rest of this? And they became very supportive of one another. I'm not sure if it's because we had Spiro in the group. And if anyone knows Spiro, he is just a breath of joy. But they really were extremely supportive of one another. Before we begin our presentations, and I'll introduce the new teachers, I would love you to introduce yourselves. So Lily, let's start with you, and thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Karen. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Lily McNair. I'm Provost and Vice President of Academic Affairs at Wagner. Hi, my name is Karen Wilson. I'm the Chair of Education and Summer I'm very excited to be here. Hi, I'm Steve Presto, and I'm the outgoing <laughs> chair. As someone joked today, I'm very outgoing. Anyway, I'm the outgoing chair of the Education Life Department at Wagner. Notice how my smile is even bigger than Karen's. <laughs> Michelle's daughter, who we've heard a lot about, so it's wonderful to see you. Uh, my name's Sean Jason, and I'm part of cohort one. Sean was a pioneer. Yeah. We used to call it new. We used to call it new teacher academy. Yeah. Go back, go back. I, uh, I work at the trees. So. Hi. I'm Danielle. Um, I was part of cohort two, um, and I teach at LaBelle Prep, and I also teach as an adjunct in the education department. And all you're seeing, all the shining stars. I think all the teachers who work in you all of a sudden become leaders in their classrooms. So it's, it's wonderful and in their schools. I'm Aaron Winnick. I'm a teacher of Mel Prep and part of cohort three. I'm Elena. I'm also part of cohort three. I'm also a teacher of Mel Prep. Tim Payal. I'm president of Mel Prep. I didn't get to be in the cohort. <laughs> <laughs> but he wants me to have an office in his school. <laughs> And Evelyn is a partner in crime, and I involve her in everything I possibly can involve her in at Wagner. Richie Garassi, president of Wagner College, delighted to be here. Uh, Lily and I can't stay too long, so we're heading out to something else. We wanted to be here just to show our interest in our commitment. Because we've heard some, I've heard about this endlessly. <laughs> <laughs> and also, Richard 
we, we have a class at my house, and it's supposed to go from 5 to 7, but students show, started showing up at 4.15, and they were still with me at a quarter to 8, and Richard would come in <laughs> in the kitchen, and he'd get some food and go in, and he'd say, okay, is it over yet? <laughs> Suzanne Damato, Administrative Assistant for the Education Department. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Spiro Gonzalez, and I'm the seventh grade drama teacher at the Bell Camp, and a member of cohort four. Also a member of cohort four, Drew Tarla, Wagner College, double alumni, right? <laughs> and two Wagner graduates. Right, two Wagner graduates. Uh, sixth grade social studies teacher. Hi, I'm Tara Brennan. I'm the seventh grade science teacher at New World Prep. And where did you graduate from, Tara? Adelphi University. <laughs> I'm Michelle I'm a sixth grade social studies teacher at the Bell Prep, and I got my business degree at Wagner. And Michelle is a second career teacher. Hi, I'm John Rattel, I'm the visual arts teacher at the Bell Prep, and I'm also a member of cohort four. And where did you graduate from? Brooklyn College. Um, I'm Alice Wagner, I'm a teacher at the Bell Prep movement and ESL, graduate from Wagner College. Graduated from Adelphi. I got my master's from Adelphi. My name is Cameron Savano. I'm a third grade self contained teacher at PS30 on Staten Island. I graduated, I got my master's from Wagner College, and I'm also a part of Cohort 4. So Karen volunteered to be our first one, and Karen was very impressive. She taught at PS30 with a group of special needs children. And it was supposed to be fourth grade level. And they were actually operating on first and second grade level. And when K Karen really structured her classroom so beautifully from the beginning, but what bothered her was that they, they, she felt that she wasn't intellectually challenging them enough in order to get them to be independent. And she devised a wonderful way of getting them to grow intellectually and the principal is enormously impressed with Karen as a first year teacher. So let's see if the technology works. Karen. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Karen Montalbano. The title of my action research project was New Teacher Critical Reflection When Working with Special Needs Students. Some background on myself, I graduated from SUNY Albany in 2009 with a bachelor's degree in psychology. I always knew that I wanted to be a teacher, so I applied and got accepted to Wagner College and started my master's degree in special education and general education grades one to six. I was also a grad assistant in the education, education department at that time. I graduated in December of 2010 and I was lucky enough to get a job at PS21 in January. I was appointed as a SETS provider. I was at, unfortunately accessed in June, but I quickly got a job at PS30 as a third grade self-contained teacher. My principal at PS30 is Mrs. Denise Spina, and my assistant principal is Alan Ein. I put up my mission statement for PS30, but I just want to focus on one part of it, which is the most important to, my, to me. Um, in the red, you'll see, we are sent in our meeting students at their instructional level, level to provide them with valuable learning experiences. At PS30, we don't force kids to catch up. We meet them where they are and help them grow. Some background on my class. I have 10 students with three paraprofessionals in the room besides myself, so I have a lot of help. I have two health paras and one bilingual para for my ESL students. I have various different disabilities, as you can see here, but my focus student is an eight-year-old boy who has ADHD and is learning disabled. And like Mrs. Garassi said, most of my students, although they're in third grade, are functioning actually between a kindergarten and first grade level.
Having my own class at PS30 was significantly different than being a pull-out sets provider at PS21. After graduating from my master's program, I was extremely eager to teach and I felt very well prepared. And after about the first couple of weeks of teaching, I realized that theories and methods that I felt passionately about in my master's program weren't really working with my low-functioning students. Um, I needed to do something to help them catch up and I had to meet their needs considering they were so low-functioning. The New York State teaching standards that I chose to focus on were Principle 2 and Principle 3. I chose these standards because they focus on students' intellectual, social, and personal development, and they also focused on giving students access to the opportunity to learn, which I felt that they lacked before coming to me in the third grade. My classroom challenge, um, my students are not able to complete independent activities without intense one-to-one -one support. No matter how structured and how much time I put into my mini lessons, they go back to their seats and raise their hands a lot and just need a lot of clarification. And so my challenge after reflecting was to provide learning opportunities that stimulated my students' intellectual development by creating small group instruction while at the same time fostering their social and personal development. I believe that my students would learn best when they learned how to think on their own because I wanted them to grow with confidence in their own abilities. My classroom challenge was to restructure my teaching strategies to include, include ways to differentiate instruction which would encourage more critical reflection. I didn't want to give them the answers. I wanted them to figure it out on their own and it had to do with how I was presenting the lessons to them. I sought out the help from my principal, Mrs. Spina, and also my literacy coach, Mrs. Torres. And they found this resource for me and actually the rest of the self-contained teachers at my school who were also having the same problems that I was having. It's called Teach All, Reach All. It's a response to intervention resource for grades K through eight. She, my principal gave us professional development with someone from our CFN. And also she gave us a bunch, a ton of planning days with the fourth and fifth grade self-contained teachers, which is wonderful because we got to get together, go through the book, pick out strategies we thought would work, and plan lessons together as a group, which was very supportive. So my plan was to increase explicit teaching and direct teaching, which meant more time teaching, not having them try and figure it out on their own. Um, longer mini lessons and shorter, more focused, independent activities. So first, I came up with this stop line, which a few of my friends in Cobra 4 also used. It proved to be very successful. Um, what I did was pretty much what we know as a mini lesson, I repeated twice. So I would start with the I do. And I found that during a mini lesson, what I wanted to get across I would call on students too often and lose track of what I really wanted them to know. And I learned in professional development that oftentimes when dealing with very little students, they only see in black and white. They don't see the gray area. So asking them all of these why questions, they didn't know. They didn't know how to respond. They didn't know what they should be thinking. So what I did was I created this stoplight to keep track of how I was teaching. During my mini lesson, I would start with the I do on red. And they learned that at that point in the lesson, they had to just stop and listen. They couldn't ask questions. They couldn't give me their input. They just had to stop and listen so I could get what I needed to teach across to them. Then we moved down to yellow, and we would work on a, some, an activity together. And I would scaffold them through that process. And then moving down to green, they would take part in the activity independently. This was all during the mini lesson at the rug with myself. At the end of this, we'd start all over again with different examples going right back to the red. So for example, I recently was teaching them about facts and opinions. So I presented what a fact was, what an opinion was, and then I put a passage on my smart board. And we read it together, and I pulled out five statements. The first one, I modeled how I would decide if it was a fact or an opinion. The next two, we did together on my support. And then when I moved down to green, they worked on two independently at the rug. 
Then I went right back to Wren. I gave them a new passage. This time, I, pulled, I, I didn't pull out any statements. They had to pull them out themselves. So I modeled, again, how to read, how to pull out a fact, how to pull out an opinion. Then they had to do it with me, with my help. And then moving down to green, they pulled either a fact or an opinion out on their own. So again, more structured, mini lessons, and explicitly teaching what I want them to know. Moving on to independent work, I would incorporate other teach all reach all strategies. This is one of my favorite, and because it was a mind opening experience, I learned about these I am working, I need help signs during the professional development presentation. And I laughed because I just figured using them with other teachers, with my students, they would just leave it on I need help instead of raising their hand. But actually, that's a picture of my students working. It made them take responsibility for their work, and they actually kept it on I am working more often than not. So that was a big learning experience, and I'm still using them today. Um, some other teach all, reach all strategies. On the left, you'll see a, part a participation board, which increased participation during my mini lessons. The kids would earn points for as many times they participated during the lesson. And at the end, the top two or three that participated the most would earn classroom tickets. And the tickets would buy prizes at the end of the week. Um, the picture on the right are called ticket off the rug cards. And it's just a quick informal assessment testing if the students really understood what was being taught. So after the independent activity, they'd come back to the rug. I'd have some kind of closing discussion. I'd have one person from each group discuss what they did in their, during their independent work. And then everyone would do one of these cards. And it would just be a simple, it could be a one-step problem. They, for example, my fact and opinion lesson, they had to either circle the fact or circle the opinion. And it's just a quick way to see who understood and who needed something retaught. My focus student was an eight-year-old boy with ADHD and a learning disability. He became my focus student because he came into me as one of my top readers, and yet every classroom activity was just very difficult for him, and I couldn't understand why. He was always very easily frustrated. He would break down. He would cry. And I couldn't understand why when I knew he had it in, in him. I knew he had potential. He's currently on a second grade reading level and he's first grade level in math. His related services, he receives um, a speech, OT, and PT. So he's also out of my room a lot with these services. This is my baseline data before I started incorporating my new structured lesson plan. It takes place in January during a two-week period. And I, I took notes of how many times he asked me questions during an independent ELA lesson. Um, very high. He averaged between five or six clarifying questions, or he would break down and I'd have to go over to him. So this is the data, the amount of prompts he needed during the two-week period before I restructured my lessons. This is my post-assessment data. Um, it was two weeks in February after I started incorporating my new structured lessons. And as you can see, it decreased a lot. Especially, he took a lot more pride in his work. He used the I am working, I need help sign, and he just really went with it. And I'm so proud of him. Even today, he's still showing me great progress. So my strategies for success were teaching the direct teaching aspect of the lesson twice and in two different ways using different examples and different vocabulary. I used many theories and philosophies while doing this action research project. First, blast this philosophy. I gave my students power by giving them an opportunity to feel confident and able to do something by teaching the concept more than once in the same sitting using different vocabulary. So again, that mini lesson that we're used to just doing once, I stretch it out and it's actually the biggest part of my lesson. I'm telling them what they need to know. Um, also, garners multiple intelligences. 
So I, I was well aware that most of my students learn differently, which was also a very big challenge for myself. So using the teachable reach, reachable resource, I increased visual cues such as the stoplight and participation board that I showed you, auditory cues repeating the I do, we do, you do part of the lesson more than once with different vocabulary, and also the tactile experiences by the I am working, I need help signs. My action research project allowed my focused student to grow more confident in himself. In growing more confident, he was able to do a lot more on his own which is great. I need my students at this point in time to be independent. They need to be able to work on their own. Leading up to third grade, I felt that everything was spoon-fed to them, and I needed to change that. My personal reflection, I learned to be more flexible and open-minded. Strategies that I didn't think would work actually worked really well. I learned that as students grow intellectually, they gain strength in areas that were previously weak, develop self-confidence, and are more comfortable socially interacting with others. And I just included a picture of all the self-contained classes at PS30. We're all very close. We just took them on the special, to the Special Ed Olympics, and that's a picture of us all together. Present to Karen with this wonderful plaque achievement, and we'd like to take a picture with your Dr. Press Two shots. One and one more. Thank you. Thank you. Next presentation is Laura. Laura has a very interesting group of students. She's an ESL teacher, and she worked with students who have a Spanish background, many of them from Mexico, and some of them have not been in school for a very long time. And she needed to figure out a way to teach them English and get them up to the sixth grade level of academics. She had a very interesting project. Yes, thank you. Um, my name is Laura Connor. I work at New World Prep. It's a pleasure to be here tonight to share with you about um, my first year experience of teaching. It's very interesting, very challenging, and very rewarding. Um, and of course, Karen and Cohort 4, they helped so much. Um, me and Tara always said it's like a little therapy session every Monday night um, to get through the first year. So my action research this year um, focused on developing successful academic strategies for SAIF students. So you're probably wondering, what is a SAIF student? A SAIF student is a student with interrupted formal education. Um, typically, they're English language learners who come from countries um, that have been inhibited by war, natural disaster, or countries with limited formal education systems as is the case uh, with this action research. A little bit about myself. I graduated from University of Delaware, and then I got my master's in TESOL from Adelphi University. Um, at the end of my student teaching, I was very lucky to get a job at New World Prep, um, and I instantly felt the love there. And um, I'm very happy there. I teach ESL grades six and seven, and I am also the ESL coordinator there. Um, a little bit about New World Prep and what drew me to work there. It was specifically created with the idea of social justice um, to educate the immigrant population of Port Richmond and the surrounding areas, and also with the goal of ensuring that all students of all backgrounds are receiving quality education. Standards that I addressed through this action research, um, first off, I really wanted to focus this year on truly understanding how English language learners lo um, learn and their different approaches to learning and language acquisition. Because as Karen said, you read all these theories and methodologies, but you don't really truly understand it until you're working one-on-one -on -one with them. And another standard that I addressed through this action research was addressed outside the classroom. And that was how to um, best force their relationships with the parents of the students that I was working with so that they were able to trust me and feel comfort with me 
Um, and in turn, that would enhance the learning of my English language learners. So being a first year teacher and the um, only ESL personnel in the school, I face a great deal of challenges. Um, first and foremost, there was a great lack of background information about a lot of my students um, from previous schools, what their educational background really truly was. In addition to that, I didn't have an initial assessment. I had had um, the limited state assessments that gave me some data about them, but I didn't have a true understanding of where they were coming from. And another challenge being faced um, throughout the year was that Spanish is the predominant language being spoken at home. So the language acquisition tends to stop at 4 o'clock when they leave school. And of course, um, one of the biggest challenges that I faced this year was that these students were being pressed to meet sixth grade standards to complete sixth grade work when um, some of them couldn't even form an English sentence. So I felt a lot of responsibility and a lot of stress to push them to meet those standards. Um, these are my two beginner English language learners that I'll focus on for this action research. Ada's on the left and Roxana's on the right. They're both beginners. Um, Ada came from Oaxaca, Mexico, over the border to Staten Island, and Roxana came over from Ecuador. Um, for this action research, my focus student was Ada because she is classified as a safe student. Um, and you'll understand why once I tell you a little bit about her. Um, first of all, and I'm sure that you'll come to understand this, I adore them and they're wonderful students and they just want to learn. That's all they want to do. They're such hard workers. Um, Ada's 13. She comes from Oaxaca, Mexico. She's one of 10 children. She was born in Staten Island, but then returned to Mexico and lived there for her whole life for 11 years. When educated in Mexico, and I um, obtained this information through a student interview, she only attended school three to four days a week um, from 8 to 12. It, the school was in the mountains. She walked to school every single day, 20-minute walk home. Um, she was one of 12 students in her class. Every subject was taught in Spanish. Um, not a whole lot of reading and writing from what she tells me, a lot of playing, a lot of art. Um, and when asked, she didn't know the name of her school. Um, again, these are my students. And then on the right are, um, is an ELA pullout group. The other girls in the group are um, proficient English language speakers, so it was really good for them um, socially to be interacting with them and to also um, for them to be gaining just more of the academic language from them. Um, so although Ada and Roxana were both beginner English language learners, they were very different and posed very different challenges for me. Ada actually entered PS20 with a week left in fourth grade. She completed their summer school and then they moved her on to the fifth grade. So, and then Roxana came over and they both had the same teacher at PS20. They completed PS20 and came over to New World Prep speaking little to no English at all. Um, the major differences, of course, are Roxana's educational background. Ecuador seems to have a pretty solid educational system, whereas Mexico um, is very different, as you could see from the U.S. Another major difference is what was going on at home. Roxana was able to practice her English. She had the internet. She had a computer. Whereas Ada, again, lived at home with a great deal of family members, no computer, no exposure to the language. Um, so some of the data that I was able to use and look at, Ada, after taking initial assessments, was tested at a grade level of 1.4, and she was in the sixth grade, 13 years old. Roxana was at a grade level of 4.7, she's in the sixth grade, she's 11. Um, so once I really got to know Ada, it became um, pretty apparent to me just how much she was lacking. Um, she struggled a great deal with letter sound recognitions, recognizing letters of the alphabet, um, stringing together sentences. Some of her strengths, though, um, are that she loves to draw. Any lesson I give her to do with drawing and art, she just, she loves. She's a very visual learner. Um, so with all these needs and all of these things lacking um, in her foundational skill set, I 
basically revamped her whole schedule for the year um, so that she's only in math and science content area classes. I see her about four hours a day. Um, Ada and Roxana push in, pull out, and then ELA support group. Um, she also was receiving Wilson two times a day just to get her letter sounds down because she was that far behind. Um, and I would also have her, whenever I worked a Saturday school, I made sure she would come for that extra day of support. So, I felt midway through the year like I was drowning. I was trying so hard with this student and I felt like she was making no progress and I just wanted to just cry <laughs> because I just was getting very frustrated and I realized that really I needed to start at the bottom. She wasn't going to be reading and writing sixth grade work. It just wasn't going to happen at that point in time. So, like I was saying, we started with just letters, um, recognizing the letter K, making a card, drawing a picture. I made her cards to take home to practice with her younger siblings. Um, when she got that, that down a little bit better, we focused on vocabulary, basic vocabulary, academic vocabulary, math vocabulary. Um, then once she got that down, we started with grammar and sentence structure, which amazingly Ada picked up really well. Um, it to this day is amazing. She can do, she can dissect a whole sentence and label every part of speech in it which a lot of sixth grade students can't do, but she loved it. Um, she loved parts of speech. So once we got that down, then I felt the pressure of the ELA test coming up. It was her first year taking it, so we really um, buckled down and started working on her essay writing. Um, so how did I go about doing all these things, achieving all these goals? I used a lot of differentiation, um, a lot of scaffolding, a lot of content support, and um, I also used a lot of visual learning. Um, Brain Pop, she really enjoyed. Wilson was a huge help for her. It's still a huge help for her. Um, picture dictionaries, um, School to War World, she loves the Disney characters, so I give her a book about Ariel and she's happy. <laughs> So although I was doing all these things, dedicating so much time to this one student, I still was just seeing this other student, Roxana, grow to all ends. Like the progress she was making was so substantial and so phenomenal. I felt like Ada really should have been making more progress. And I finally realized that the Spanish only at home was really the problem because she would come home after the weekend and it'd be like a blank slate. It's like she never spoke English before again. And that was frustrating to me because here I was working so hard and then she would go home and it would all be forgotten. And so I called in the parents and I said, you know, is she speaking any English at home? Is she practicing? Is she reading? No. And you know, I empathize because she doesn't have support at home and she's frustrated and she's not picking up on it and nobody's telling her to speak English though. How do I address this challenge? I needed, um, to increase the parental support and involvement. In that turn, I needed to foster relationships. So I created a very strong relationship with her family. I visited her at home. Um, I created a relationship with her younger brother, who will be entering the school next year. I would give her books to read to her younger brothers at night. Um, and I also made sure that her family and their well-being um, was in a good state. So I am happy to say that I have seen so many results um, with her, although, of course, you know, you always want more. Um, I have seen great progress in both my girls. Um, Ada and Roxana have both doubled in their grade level since the beginning of the year with the task work. Um, Ada is now at a 2.7 grade level, and Roxana is now at a 6.4 grade level. Um, and the real progress I see with Ada, because she still struggles a lot with letter sound recognition, so those assessments are a little iffy. But um, even today we were reading out loud and she read, we were reading the outsiders and she read this full paragraph out loud with that advanced group and she read it beautifully. I was so proud, because um, she never would have been able to do that at the beginning of the year. But, so this is a piece of her work in September, um, all Spanish. This is a piece of her work midway through the year. Um, I'd given her a first grade level workbook because um, that's what she needed. So she started slowly. And then this, I'm proud to say, is a piece of work um, done in April. We completed a cultural um, research project in my class. 
and she wrote a seven paragraph essay where she t spoke about her culture, about Mexico, and she compared and contrasted it to the United States culture. Um, so what I took away from this action research, aside from the progress seen um, for next year, I plan on having a strong initial assessment. Um, I've already created a student interview for next year, so I can get um, first-hand feedback on just where they're coming from, just what the educational system is that they're coming from. Um, and I am also proud to say that for next year, New World Prep plans on um, incorporating a strong parent program for immigrant parents um, with community resources of Project Hospitality in El Centro. We plan on holding literacy classes um, for parents uh, so that they are able to secure good jobs, they're able to develop their own language acquisition, and that they're able to become accustomed more so with the American education system. And of course, I took a great deal away from this. Um, one of the biggest things for next year is for me to create clear goals for myself and for my students. Um, definitely, less is more. Focus on a few things at a time. Don't get overwhelmed by all the standards and the needs and the wants of so many people. Just focus on that one student needs um, and teach them the essentials. Reading, writing, listening, speaking. Um, without that, they can't really progress forward. Um, and of course, to celebrate the small successes. Two shots. First one. Hold on. I'm going to do two more. And one more. Do one more. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thanks for your patience. Right. Okay. Thank you. All yes. right. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next is is Alexandra. Yeah. Alexandra Alice. is Alice is very interesting because I don't usually see her this way. I'm in her gym and she's in sports clothes, but she has a wonderful presentation. Um, yes. So is it up here already? I hope so. I don't know how to get it here. How to get it down? Does anybody know how to get it up here? Oh, Laura. Oh, Laura. Just press the gate. First and foremost, I would like to thank my husband, my kids, family for all your support, as well as Wagner College, Professor Garatsky, um, the LaBelle staff, Ms. Finn, my core four, because without you guys, this would never have been possible. Thank you guys very much. Okay, no gym, no problem. John W. LaBelle. Okay, this pitch parcel, entrance. Okay, John W. Well, mission statement, to create an environment that breaks down barriers and promotes understanding, acceptance, and growth. Okay, um, this is my second year teaching um, at Lavelle Prep. I taught Spanish last year, and this year I was asked to teach movement in ESL. I graduated from Wagner College, where I received an athletic scholarship in basketball and in softball, with a degree in elementary education. My husband and I own a small company called DMC Communications. 
my motto is you can do, make anything happen as long as you put your mind to it. I, I was inducted to New Jersey Basketball Hall of Fame in 2008, and I'm married for 20 years and have three wonderful children. Okay, my program challenge. To establish a PE in space built to become an auditorium. Working with eighth grade, maturing eighth grade boys and girls. That's a challenge in itself. Not having a traditional gym with no access to outside and no ability to be outside. This is my space. You see the gym, it's empty. This is what I was giving at the beginning of the year. Okay, the standards that I needed to meet was help healthy level of fitness, personal social behavior, and the physical setting. Values to health, social enjoyment, and self-expression. Okay, my standards was health, fitness, personal health, and behavior. Sorry, I was one ahead. Okay, my challenge. How do I develop physical education skills for maturing eighth grader boys and girls in a large empty room while taking consideration their cultural Genders, genders, and learning differences. Genders, sorry. Okay, I use Glazer's uh, theory. The perceived world is gym with a basketball hoop. Most people see the gym when you walk in that says basketball hoop. Well, I didn't have that. So I had to do something to make my kids enjoy it. So I decided to do circuit training. Circuit training is when they go in stations and they work on different cardiovascular stuff. By doing this, I show them love, power, freedom, and, and this took care of their behavior. Doing all this on their own merit, it controlled their behavior. Okay, using Glasser's theory, I also helped develop a basketball team, a cheerleading team, and we all voted on a mascot at Lavelle Prep. Here is a video of our students, I can get it up, have, who have never, ever gone to a college basketball game, ever. It was, an, it was, for them, they were like, they went to a professional basketball, they never went to a college game. The cheerleaders cheered at halftime of the game. The boys played in a basketball game. We were 10 and one without having a gym, not ever shooting at a hoop. I did skills inside the gym that made them, when we went to a gym and actually had a gym, they appreciated it. They were like, oh my goodness, I get to shoot at a hoop. This was a very, very good thing for them. The mascot, also was voted upon the kids in the school. Um, Howard Gardner's spatial intelligence involved the potential to recognize and use patterns in a wide space and more confined area, which I utilized very well. This is a circuit training where the kids would go. Is another video of my students in class going from station to station. Hopefully it's going on. You see them here working on different components of fitness, from doing sit-ups to doing agility, weight training where they're lifting different circuits. He's doing agility running in and out. And I have another student coming up who's doing agility with basketball. This is all in this confined fit space that I was given. Children didn't even know they were being assessed. They're in there, they're enjoying it. They're, they got a choice, 30 seconds, they go from one spot to the other. Everybody enjoys this, my class. They do not want to miss gym, which is a great thing for me. Each of them are there. This is all different stations. This changes every day. The beginning of the class, we do P90X, we do Zumba, and then we walk into this. This is the 60-minute class worth of gym. Anthony Siciliano is a student that I um, focused on. This student had very, very low cardio and muscular strength as a 12 year old, was very low for his age. What, he couldn't go on hiking trips, he couldn't go anywhere very long when, without getting tired. His mother was actually very nervous in the beginning of the year, but she said, I don't know if he could take your gym class, any gym class, because of his heart. Anthony was also shy, very, very reserved, would not um, mix in with the other kids. Well, by the end of my class, he's a leader. These are assessments that we used in my class, all different types. This is three different classes. You'll see segments of different pictures of that. Okay, these are sa samples of jump roping, running roping, basketball, which I do in this space that we use for a gym. Pull-ups, sit-ups, everything is covered. I, I invented this uh, uh, assessment, which is called LALA. It's called Lavelle Active Lifestyle Assessment. This is a combination of running, 
um, running, jumping, all the state standards that are used in the United States. It's called the President's Challenge. I used a piece of the President's Challenge and New York Fitness Gram, and I combined them because I couldn't use either one because the Fitness Gram, I don't have a, you got to test a mile run. I can't do that. So I made my own assessment between the two um, Fitness Grams uh, assessments that the state uses, and this is what came up for Anti Siciliano. In the beginning of the year, he's in yellow. He's very low. His standards of doing push-ups are 10. His shuttle run was like a 12. The, the norm for a kid his age is in blue. It, it's pretty high. He's pretty low. By the end of the year, he's moving very, he's moving tremendously. Every, every, every aspect of physical education, the kid has improved. Okay, Anthony's results. He improved in overall in class. His physical health and social interaction with other kids is tremendous. His mother even emailed me saying, I don't know what you're doing in class, Ms. Coughlin, but this kid is hiking, he's jumping, he wants to play football. He's a different child, which is, I'm, I'm happy that this worked out. Um, his cardio endurance is good, his flexibility, his muscle, his body mass, he's getting stronger. I weighed him, he grew two inches, he's getting thicker. His whole social, he's now not a shy kid, he's now become a leader. Because just like in my class, it's not, you don't have to be really health, uh, a, a jock, you just have to be healthy. And that's what I instilled in the kids. You don't have to be the star basketball player to be a man. You could be a really a kid that could do the same components as he can, and I, I make every kid feel that way. They love that. Because no kid is better than the other. Even the jocks I have to put down a little bit because they think they, they run the classroom. And they actually, everybody has, has a fair share. My basketball team, no problem for Lavelle's Preps basketball team. Our team was 10-1. and one. We only lost one game, and it was to ourselves. And when we put, a, put this in the tournament, we played New World Prep, which was a very competitive game, but we still won. <laughs> okay. um, my reflection. I realized that a teacher, even without resources, you can, you can use your creativity to make classes fun and still accomplish your goals. Thank you very much. tell you, I always loved going to Alice's classroom, I had a lot of fun, but then she had the students jump rope, and I used to jump rope as a kid, So I, and they didn't know how to do double dutch, so I started jumping rope with them and teaching them what to do, and I got involved with her, it was great. First one. Yes. Remember when you said you wanted to join the gym? Comic Con in 2010. Um, just an example, 
of some of my artwork. Um, I am an illustrator and I think that it resonates with the kids because I am sort of very youthful in my artwork and they enjoy at this age comic books and graphic novels and things like that. <coughs> so a little bit about my education. Um, I received my BA in Art History from College of Staten Island and I minored in studio art. Um, through the College of Staten Island I was given the opportunity to work um, as a visiting artist or a teaching scholar through the Discovery Institute. Um, so I would go to different uh, schools through Staten Island, um, Manhattan, and Brooklyn and uh, would get to work with the kids collaboratively within a classroom setting. Um, so here's just some of the pictures. We would work on um, creating artwork and posters in the community or also doing uh, set designs and um, other props and stuff for uh, school uh, theater and presentations. Um, after that, I went to Pratt Institute um, to study for my master's in interior design. Um, I put a picture of a drafting table because that's pretty much all I saw at Pratt Institute. Uh, I was drafting and doing blueprints for about eight to nine hours a day and uh, saw very little of anything else, like little collaboration and it wasn't very creative. So after about a year of that, I decided that it wasn't for me and I needed a lot more uh, interaction. And so I decided to change my career goal and. Um, thought about teaching and decided that I wanted to uh, go in that direction. So I applied to Brooklyn College and was accepted um, and received my master's in art education K through 12. All right. Shortly after that, I started going to um, the summer program at Lavelle Prep, which, um, and then working there, but I was so drawn to working there and so excited about working there because immediately I was working with such enthusiastic people and collaborating, collaborating every day, um, talking about new uh, ways to um, to incorporate technology within the classroom and how to uh, <coughs> develop this um, interdisciplinary curriculum. And it was just really exciting and always fast paced and something going on. There's not a day that goes by where you're not collaborating with somebody in Lavelle Prep. So my responsibilities at Lavelle Prep, uh, like I said, I'm the visual arts teacher. I teach uh, six visual arts classes, but I also teach a wellness class. Um, so I'm always promoting positive behavior and actions within the classroom um, and school environment. And I also uh, collaborate, collaboratively um, teach a living history documentary course with Mr. Ingram, um, where we are um, researching the life of John Lavelle and creating a documentary. And uh, I also help run the student council meetings. Here's just a picture of one of my visual arts classes. Okay, so the professional standards that I decided to focus on, um, they really uh, focused on um, individual group motivation, um, the ability to uh, positively social uh, socialize and interact and, and, and actively engage um, in a learning environment through social motivation and intrinsic learning. And also um, through a variety of instructional strategies and materials and um, being able to problem solve and uh, skill build. <coughs> Some pictures of students' work. Um, my personal goals really stem from these professional goals as well. Um, they just talk about maintaining a safe environment where the students feel free to create uh, work and um, work with each other, collaborate, <coughs> um, really promote each other and inspire each other with the, their growth process um, and eliminate any negative attitudes or comments that they might um, feel the need to sort of say to each other. So, my reflection on the sixth grade. The sixth grade is a time of many hormonal changes and insecurities, as we know. Uh, I was there, I remember that, not too long ago. Um, and therefore, the students become very emotional and frustrated. Um, this is a rendition of myself. <laughs> so some of the things we might, might forget that we get stressed over, but I hear it from all my students every day, is something's going on with their parents, or um, you know, girls, or boys, their friends, tests, homework being cool, not being cool, responsibilities that they need to have that they didn't have before, um, they're going through puberty, they have bullies, they are a bully and they're not aware of it, um, all these things come up day to day. 
Um, I also travel with a cart and often I feel rushed trying to get all my supplies together, get to the next class. Um, when I reach my, my next class, um, it's complicated by the fact that the students um, are in the hallway transition or uh, confronted with all sorts of behavioral issues or some of the things that I talked about that might cause stress. Um, and I'm aware of a lot of these actions and the remarks that they make to each other upon arrival. So, the challenge then. How do I begin to motiv motivate my students to be engaged in a collaborative, creative, and artistic experience uh, while they're in an unfocused and unsettled adolescent frame of mind? Um, I've been creating collaborative small group lessons because I really thrive on collaboration. I love working with them and I like to see what they come up with, which is um, also why I really was inspired to work at LaBelle because we have such a diverse population. Um, we have 40% special needs and all the kids come from different uh, household environments and that just means to me that they're going to bring their own experiences to their artwork and their creativity. Um, my group lessons I found weren't 100% effective um, because they, they lack this demand of immediate um, participation and sort of consideration of each student. So although they were working collaboratively in small groups, they were often, um, it, it, it wasn't creating the environment of the whole class that I wanted it to. Here's some examples of um, earlier collaborative projects that I was um, incorporating. So we did one that was called Modern Cavemen, um, where they were broken up into tribes and they had to work together um, to discover what it is that they had in common and they wanted to leave if they were cavemen for future generations and they had to think about uh, symbol stories and how did they do that without uh, text or any sort of written language. They really liked that. And um, then we did another uh, clever drawing where they had to break down the pieces of a playing card and enlarge them and see if they can fit them back together to make a giant playing card out of all their enlarged drawings. Um, so here's sort of a reflection on visual arts as a um, as a curriculum um, and as a media. Uh, art is uh, personal, sorry. Art is personal and therefore emotional. Um, this can leave students who already have uh, or are diagnosed with emotional issues feeling even more vulnerable and confrontational. Um, beginning artists often see good art uh, as something you can show off and they're not really concerned with the learning process uh, or the experience in just making art. And I wanted to sort of redirect that, that idea um, students' view of what art can be was very limited in the beginning. Um, they only viewed art as uh, co commercial art, cartoons, um, comic books. And although um, I agree and I work in that field and I really enjoy it, I wanted to broaden their horizons and their ideas of what art can be. So um, if unchallenged, I was afraid that my students might just gauge um, their growth and their creativity based on um, their technical skills or um, you know, what people think is good art. So as many of my other cohorts, uh, we, were, we uh, found inspiration in Glass's Four Principles of Effective Communication. And um, this really resonated with me, I'm not sure about anybody else, but because I, I thought back on my own education and I thought about Pratt, why did, was I so unhappy there? And it's because I wasn't really collaborating with anybody, I wasn't feeling the love of the environment that I should have been, it was sort of stale and therefore it was never fun and I felt like I was in this little prison box. So um, I thought, well they, maybe this is why that they're not collaborating in a positive, loving way. Um, I really need to make sure I focus on these four principles and make sure that they're being instilled every day before my class starts. So my challenge solution was then I decided to begin each lesson with um, my most challenging classes, which were 605 and 606, um, with a quick collaborative warm-up game that follows Glasser's four principles um, for effective communication. So um, it, I made it sort of into this game challenge for them, um, and the, the, the rules in which I gave them, you'll see in this video of them doing it. Uh, I sped up the rules, uh, I sped up the video because they had to make choices and sometimes it took a little while, so I wanted you guys to see them actually working, otherwise it would take a long time.
Each student was called by their number to come to the front of the class where there is a large drawing pad. They will then choose a material from markers, crayons, or color pencils and draw anything they wish in any color to contribute to the drawing. The next student will then be called up by their number and will have to add it to the previous student's drawing. This motivates the students to watch the process and prepare themselves for their turn. This process must be done without any negative comments towards the other students or their artwork. If a negative comment is made, the game stops. We then count how many students contributed to the drawing while the environment remained positive. The goal is to engage every student in the artistic experience while it remains positive. The results of the two classes will then be tallied and compared, and the class with a higher level of positive collaboration will engage in a small celebration at the end of that week. Um, so the small celebration was just I got them donuts. And they, they really liked that, but I wasn't really banking on them loving the idea that they're getting donuts. It wasn't meant for that. Um, and you'll see in the results that that wasn't really what was driving the whole experiment. Um, so this is how I, um, uh, this is how I addressed classes uh, theory. So the freedom to choose from or pick any variety of material that they wanted to when they were coming up to participate and the ability to choose to make um, any mark or um, any image that they wanted. Some of them made images, some of them just decided. At first they were, you know, they, they, they were like asking questions, can I do this, can I make them? It's your thing, You're, you can um, do whatever you like. So I think that gave them a lot of freedom and they were excited about that. And I think it really broke the idea that um, a drawing belongs to you. I didn't want them to feel like this was, a, this was their thing that they owned and no one else could draw on it. I wanted them to start to understand that it's about the process and the creativity and collaboration. So if uh, at first, you know, oh, can I draw over this student's work? Yeah, that's your choice, you can do that. Um, and then it sort of spiraled down from there and they became, it didn't become um, something that stressed them out, but more of, a, oh, it was fun to just collaborate. Um, the fun part, uh, was the unknown outcome, it becomes suspenseful, suspenseful and addictive to them. Um, watching the work of art come to life in front of them, um, they're questioning what will become uh, come of it, what will the next person do, will they draw over mine, will they just add to it, will there be an image at the end, will it just look like an abstract art? Um, will we remain positive, uh, will we win the prize at the end? Um, uh, the power was instead by developing the ability to communicate positively with each other and also the ability to create a truly collaborative drawing. And then the love part was the question mark. Um, the goal was to instill a sense of love and community and family uh, through this positive process. So um, this was done in a two-week period and the way that I sort of gauged their, their um, growth was to see how many how many kids they could get through within each um, positive warm up. So um, for six or five, the first day we only got through two kids, and we said, okay, today this, this as far as we got, we'll see how we do tomorrow. Um, the next day we they were excited. We got through four kids, um, which was a little bit better. Uh, next day after that they regressed, and they only made it through two kids again. So um, I think that they started to see and. In the beginning, they were starting to sort of be down on each other. Come on, shh, be quiet, we want to do this. And they would say negative remarks that way. But then after a while, they realized that if they don't push each other, that they, it just happens. Next day, they were able to get through three kids. Um, the day after that, they were able to finish with five, seven, 13. And then on the last day, they were actually able to get through the whole class. With 606, the first day, they were really excited. We got through six kids. Um, and you can see them really thinking about the moves and marks that they're making and contributing to the drawing. The next day, they got through seven. You can start seeing uh, some images happening instead of just lines. Uh, the day after that, got through seven. 
They were aggressive one day and they got uh, through six that day. They got ambitious the next day and they got through 14. They started creating some sort of uh, image between all of them. And they started talking about it also through the process. Oh, this could become that. Oh, if you added that, this would be this. And they really got excited. Um, the next day they got through the whole class and for some reason they decided, if you look sideways, that these were all going to be slanted faces today. And um, also the other rule was that you couldn't pick up your, your, your material off the paper once you did. That was the end of your term. Just to keep it like on a time, time pace. Uh, and then also the day after that they got through the whole class and they were so into it that I just said, oh, keep going, you know, we'll just, we'll go through the class twice, we'll go through the class as many as we can. And it became this, um, just energy, you can see the energy within the drawing. Um, so my results were that both classes showed significant improvements in behavior, um, and both, both classes were able to control their remarks they made um, in a collaborative and positive way once that they understood um, the results that could come out of it. Um, compliments were even given by the students once they started enjoying the process. They were saying, oh, that was cool, and oh, look what you did here. Um, and they were inspiring each other to, to participate. Um, 606 uh, looked forward to doing these warm-ups every day, and even after they got the, the reward, they were the class that won. They wanted to do more, and they wanted to con contribute um, in a whole group activity. Um, 605 was a little bit uh, was a little bit different in, in their participation. They saw it more as a burden after a couple days. They oh we gotta do this collaboration again, um, and they weren't so excited about it. Um, after the warm ups, I could tell that both classes became conscious of the of what they were saying because the warm ups instilled this idea that oh if we do say something negative, then we're not gonna be able to continue with this process. So once the process ended, they still had that frame of mind. Um, 606 was a lot more relaxed and focused to go to start a lesson, um, where 605 was less um, affected by the process and they were easily more uh, distracted right after the process. So my last reflection is where to make improvements. Um, I'm definitely going to continue this for the year. Um, it's been helping me, uh, especially as the year winds down, they're starting to get a little bit more excited and um, it definitely needs to be done in the beginning of my classes. So uh, I would definitely change the type of um, direct collaborative warm-ups I do. Um, like I said, one of the classes were getting a little bored with the process. I would try to add or introduce more materials um, and also a skill building aspect to the exercise. You know, maybe give them a challenge or like a game of twist or something, spin the wheel and then if it lands on, okay, you have to draw 12 circles, then how do they, how do they creatively draw 12 circles or you have to draw, uh, you know, perpendicular lines across the entire page, how they do that. So this aspect of skill building. And that's my, that's where I'm going. Thank you. Do two. One more. Ah, hold on. That's good. Thank you.
I have to thank everyone. This is going by itself right now. Um, <laughs> so that might go really fast. <laughs> so what I decided to do was, um, I like to work with art and technology and to differentiate instruction in the social studies classroom. I saw that it really led to opportunities for the children to express themselves. So that's what my whole challenge was, or my topic was. My background, um, I was a career change, as uh, Professor Barassi had said. I worked in Verizon for 18 years, and I decided to change my career in 2009. And I received my master's education in Wagner, and I became dual certified in childhood education. I did join Lavelle Prep as a para, and then I, like I said, became a sixth grade social studies teacher, which I absolutely love. Um, John Lavelle uh, Prep School is a really dynamic school, and one of the focuses is that we like to fully in integrate all our classes and, and activities together. And we like to really give the children the confidence required to be successful students today, and we want them to be leaders tomorrow. And our goal is to get them to the next step, which we hope is college at some point. So that's our goal, and obviously that's um, Dr. By Allen, our president, and Mrs. Finn, Ms. Finn for our, our principal. So I picked three uh, teaching standards, and the principles that I actually picked was I wanted to provide the children with learning opportunities to support their intellectual, their social, and personal development. I wanted to differ in their approaches to learning because, as you know, everyone learns differently. So we have visual, we have auditory, kinesthetic, and you have to you have to try to get everyone involved. So what I did was I changed my instructional strategies according to how I felt the children would learn. What I realized was a lot of times they loved working on art projects and they loved when I used technology. So we watched movies about, I mean, we, we watched Percy Jackson, you know, because it talks about Greek mythology. So I tried to infuse it. I didn't do Prezi, so I was trying to be fancy on <laughs> I wasn't going to go there. Um, so students, what my challenge was, was that students came from certain public schools where they were not really academically inclined. And we needed to change that attitude while creating learning opportunities for growth both academically and emotionally. So my action plans was to diminish the opportunities for negative behavior, enhance positive learning um, opportunities, and I needed to change the orientation of the students. You know, you have to get them to wanting to learn, and that's sometimes a big challenge in itself. And at Lavelle, we have a point system where we, we try to be regimented, and they have to earn points, okay? And sometimes the children react to that negatively in the beginning. And then as they start conforming, I guess <laughs> would be a good point, um, they want to earn those points. Okay. So the theories that I applied, like my cohorts, um, was Glasser's theory, as well as Gardner's multiple intelligences. I had two students um, who I wanted to focus <coughs> on just to see if what I felt was correct, which was to infuse that art and technology to see if it would make a difference. One of them was Carmine, and at the beginning of the year, he was very disinterested. He did not participate. Um, I had to redirect him a lot. He was disrespectful. He did not do assignments. And for the most part, he'd read his independent reading book at my, in my class. That's, that was him. My student too, which I'll name as Jane Doe, um, she was very disinterested. She did not participate. Uh, she needed redirection. She faked illness all the time. And she also gave delinquent assignments. And it was very hard to even keep her in the room. Okay. So that was my, my two children that I said, let, let me try to see if I could change them a little bit. Um, Carmine 
did have an IEP, and he um, it was speech he was it was speech and language impaired. He received special uh, speech and occupational services. He absolutely was a visual learner, and I knew that. Um, he enjoyed math, but he struggled with reading comprehension. So I knew that if I was going to give him work, and if it was out of the textbook, he would he would be very disinterested because it was hard for him. Not because he couldn't do it, it would take him longer. So it was always that he was competing with the rest of the class, and then he, would, he wouldn't be able to do it. Jane Doe, Jane Doe, um, she is a general education student. She has no accommodation. She's been held out twice in the past years. She's very argumentative and challenges staff and authority. Um, and she involves herself in the social aspects of middle school instead of the academics. So she was very hard to reach at first. And um, how I really tried to focus with her was I tried to praise her. And it was just little steps. I really had to work with baby steps with her. So it was just even getting her to praise her to, wow, you're really paying attention. Um, good job, you did the do now. And as I continued on and on, that's what made it work for her. And I have to tell you that she sits in my class now. She doesn't leave. So I'm, I'm glad of that. And she um, does the work in my class, in my classroom, not at home, but in my classroom. So um, I'm glad to say that. The methods I used during the class, like I said, I wanted to really infuse art and technology, was I did a lot of art projects where the children could express themselves. So I did a personal hoplite shield. Um, the children had to make Egyptian travel brochures. They had to make biographical poems. So I wanted to also infuse the ELA part too. And what I noticed was is that when they were able to really put themselves into the project, it really came very nice. So these were just some examples of the hoplite shields and how I explained it to them was that when the soldiers made their shields, that was the, that was the most important part of them, their shield. They designed it and it always had to mean something. So when the children made their shields, it had, it had to mean something to them. So I had one child who actually had um, a dragon, and he said, I made the dragon, and I made the dragon because I wanted that dragon to protect me. And as he was talking about it, he actually spoke about um, he, his home burned down, and he, his family had to really get back on track. So he, wanted, he felt that if he had that dragon, maybe it could protect him. So it really, it, really was personal and I absolutely loved what they did with this and everybody had a meaning. There was one that had a tear in his eye and he said, well, there's always sadness in the world, wipe it away. So it, it was just excellent artwork. We did do the, it, um, the travel brochures of Egypt and the children liked this and this was also, they had to do research on it. but. The children were very creative. Some were great with doing work on the computer. Others hand wrote it, and that was okay too. I did not grade it any, I mean, obviously if they did a great job, they got what they were supposed to, but if you weren't an artist, that's okay, because you were accepted for what you can do. And that's where the love came in, and the acceptance, and the freedom, because they knew that whether they drew a smiley face, and were able to express it, or whether they were able to really go further, it would be okay. Um, we made biographical poems and what that was was that they talked about, they had to, it's a specific poem and we did it on Greek gods and they had to infuse a lot of information in it and then they drew about that god. So um, we had Hades, Athena and they really did beautiful work. So when they did these projects, what I, what I found was they had the freedom and power to create and choose. 
they had fun using their imagination while creating and loved because every piece of artwork was valued and appreciated. And when they were working on these pieces, it, it created such an energy in the room. Everybody had a good time and nobody really made fun of anybody's work. They really enjoyed it. The technology, I use a lot of technology and I very rarely will go through using a textbook. Um, I really try to teach from PowerPoint presentations, YouTube videos, and I like to give them experience if I can find subject specific video games. So what I did was, I just showed you, well the PowerPoint's in it, but visual and auditory integrity learners I felt were great for PowerPoint and it was interactive. The YouTube videos, whatever I was teaching at that point, I would try to find a video specific to it. So if we were talking about um, ancient Egypt, I would try to find something on there and get them involved in the video. There were a lot of subject specific online games and one of the games that I used was um, when we were trying to prepare a pharaoh's burial, they actually had to embalm a pharaoh and it was an online game and, and they really enjoyed it. <laughs> they, they loved it. Um, then you had to be able to create a pyramid. So there were a lot of online games that I worked with them. Uh, the life as a, as a worker and you take the path and whatever path you would take would be how the game would go. So they enjoy that. I, the, the thing that I did also was to begin with, I tried to do to do now is that challenge students' intellectual thinking. What I also realized was not only did they love the art and the technology, but they really liked to be, to debate with one another. So I always did, or I've always tried to do to now is that um, challenge them and that let them have a discussion amongst each other. So some of them was uh, better to start free and then be a, flat, a fat slave. Um, a child's life is like a piece of paper on which every person leaves a mark and they had to defend their answers or express how they felt. And once they did that, and some of them, because if, like I said, if they weren't, um, if they couldn't express themselves in writing, if they drew a picture and they could explain the picture, I allowed them to do that as long as they got some meaning out of it. We also went to, um, Snug Harbor and the Metropolitan Museum of Art because I wanted to infuse the culture into the classroom. And myself as well as John were very excited about this because when we did go to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, it brought what we were teaching them in the classroom alive. And you'd be surprised, like sometimes you don't think they're listening, but when they could name Greek gods or when they can name specific pieces of, pieces of artwork, they got it. They they really got it. So um, it was just great to see. So my two students, where are they now? Um, Carmine, he's he's doing good. Um, he does what he has to. What I usually try to do, actually with Carmine and Jane Doe, is if we're doing any type of work, I try to station myself with them to see if if getting them on top of things will help them. Carmine has expressed an interest in the class. He no longer reads his independent reading book. Um, he actually contributes to the classwork. Um, he loves coming to social studies. Jane Doe, Jane Doe doesn't walk out of the class like I said, and it's funny because I don't have to tell her to write anything down anymore. And I noticed that we did um, character traits of Alexander the Great and it was just so funny. I was writing all the character traits down and she looked and she said, hey, did anybody write this down? And it was just so interesting to see that she wrote it all down without being directed to. And she was like, write it down. 
it's important. And I was, I was, I don't know, it took a lot for her to come around, so I was very happy with that. As far as their results, Carmine went up. Carmine is now his assessment scores, he is at a 93% in assessments. So he went, he really went up. Jane Doe, she flip-flops, it depends. But what I've done with Jane Doe is, and I realized she gets very frustrated when she's reading tests. So I'll sit with her and we talk about the question. And she knows the answer. She gets frustrated. So after like the first two questions that I start her off on that way and try to get her to think like that, she does it. So she passed, she's, she's passing with her assessment. So I'm crossing my fingers. As far as the homework, um, Carmine is handing in the homework. Jane Doe does not hand in the homework. Um, it's not unusual for Jane Doe not to. Um, her present path is unfortunately not as successful. Um, she's probably going to be held back. So I'll try. So what do I what do I want to do for myself as well as my students? There's a few things. Um, what I'd like to do is in the beginning of the school year, I'd like to administer a multiple intelligence test. And the reason is I want to see each class and what type of focus I should put on creating my lessons. Um, I want to review my past lessons and include more visual and kinesthetic activities if, need, if needed. I want to create an assessment that focuses on specific ancient civilizations that would be taught to activate prior knowledge. Um, what I did this, this year was we had the general assessment of what the children knew about social studies. But I really want to, I want to tailor it even more. Um, I'll continue to reflect on um, the current day's lessons and tweak them as needed. And we do that even from class to class sometimes. So what do I, what was my reflection? Um, what I realized was that if I give my students the praise, love, and respect, as in Glass's theory, your students become confident, they become motivated, you can have intellectual conversations with them, and they do mature over a period of time. So I, I just think that if you can do this all the time, you can get them to the next level. And that's it. about Michelle is that she worked for, what was your other company? Verizon. Verizon. She became a para and now a teacher. So a long way in this journey and she's a great teacher today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nice job. Can do two shots. One more. Well, one more. That's good. Thank you. Okay, now it's Tara. Oh, she deleted the other one. Okay, that was the one. Yes, thank you. Hello, everyone. Tara Brennan, and I drank a lot of coffee, so <laughs> my name is pretty basic. Um, uh, what I decided to focus on was increasing students' ability to incorporate writing into the science curriculum. So I think when we all think of science writing, we think of this picture, like formulas, equations, but 
that's not science, right? No one really wants to write like that, and um, I really wanted to tackle that in my science class. Just a little bit about New World Prep. Uh, the real mission was to provide uh, students with academic rigor and relevance, and more specifically that there's a school-wide focus on critical thinking and reading and writing across every content area. So regardless of what subject you teach, you are a reading and writing teacher. As a teacher um, my first year, I wanted to focus on two things. The first one was, to that, was that I was going to constantly reflect um, on myself and the impact I was having on my students and how I was going to grow professionally in doing that. And then also that I was going to use a variety of instructional techniques um, and always switch it up, never keep it stagnant, and always kind of look at how I could change it up in the classroom. So when I began teaching, I realized that I wasn't getting the quality of work from my students that I wanted. I, especially when it came to writing, I had these expectations and I wasn't being satisfied with what they were submitting me. So how was I going to get them to demonstrate this? And then more importantly, how was I going to get them to want to demonstrate this? Um, so like I said, we all at New World Prep, we know that we are teachers of reading and writing. And I recognize that, that I needed to be a writing teacher and reading teacher, but how is I going to do this in the science curriculum? Um, so two things that occur that help me face this challenge. One, just like co all of cohort four, is that I learned about Glasser's theory. So he says that every individual needs four basic needs to be satisfied in order for the most success to occur, regardless of who you are, student, parent, teacher, anything. You need to have love, power, fun, and freedom in your life, and then you can be more successful. So learning that, and then also realizing that my students um, didn't have the ability and didn't, or they had failed prior in researching scientifically to write scientifically. So I knew I needed to combine these two things in order to have writing success in science. So to tackle this, my project was to use project-based learning in my classroom in combination with Glasser's theory. Um, and also using literacy strategies to help students feel successful. So I used very structured graphic organizers. So you can see on the left, there's just a structured graphic organizer for students to write in and then turn that writing into something more sophisticated. So how did I incorporate Glasser's theory? Well, I um, gave them the freedom to choose whatever they were writing about. If that was organs, diseases, elements in the periodic table, or minerals, they were given that choice, which really went a long way. And then the fun part is just working with technology, working in small groups, and um, that provided them with you know, just more desire to complete the project. That's me. <laughs> These are two students working with technology. They're writing, um, they're writing on a mineral and creating an advertisement and an informational piece with it. OK, so now with power. Um, part of Glasser's theory was that they were provided with these organizers and that simplified the research process for them and it made them feel powerful. They were able to complete this and turn it into a five paragraph essay. At the beginning it was the students were, um, a lot of the students in New World Prep and just in general they, they're functioning at a lower level than their grade and so I needed to provide them with something that would be able to get them to write at their grade level and this was something that really helped. A lot of structure turning this into an essay. Um, this is an example of student work. So it was on an element um, on the periodic table and the economic impact it has, the um, uses it has in a daily life. And this is actually a special ed student who at the beginning was giving me not even complete sentences and now I was getting a five paragraph research essay. Now the love part of Glasser's theory, students were successfully completing these graphic organizers and then transferring it to an essay and um, incorporating their writing all the time into the science assignments. And in that, they felt pride within themselves, they loved their work, they were even like, Ms. Brennan, can I take this home um, and write that over the weekend? I'm like, you want to write a research paper on phosphorus this weekend? I'm like. That was great. That was a great feeling for me that they wanted to do well for themselves and for me. 
So how did I know my goals were accomplished? I think in just those two pieces, a, a special ed student, that second one was an English language learner student, the final product was immensely improved. They are actually handed in these essays, they actually wanted to do it, they had fun doing it, and they felt powerful at the end. So um, in what worked well, the students felt power with the structure. They were given the freedom to choose, and that increased participation. The small groups and technology made the assignment fun, and then providing them with that structure made them feel more successful and thus feel more loved. And then that creates a feeling of pride within themselves, and finally, success begets success. Of course, challenges definitely came up. There were hurdles I had to get over, and that was in, especially in my classes of students with special needs. Um, it was very difficult for them to transfer their research into a written form. And um, I definitely see work that needs to go into that, uh, as that was one of my challenges. That's also something that I will continue to improve on in my practice. Um, the first step that I realized that improved my practice this year was that giving them that choice made them want to participate more. Then. Um, the structure made them not only participate, participate more, but also want to write about their topic and write about it well, not just, just do the minimum. And I think the biggest thing that I will do to improve is that I want to incorporate Glasser's theory, not just in these projects, not just randomly, but every day, every lesson. Students need to have that feeling of love, fun, power, and freedom every lesson. And if I can do that, I know that every day would be successful. Um, and then lastly, with, that, with the students with special needs, they need more structure. I thought I was giving them structure. They needed even more structure. So I, can, I can only can keep making that more scaffolded for them. And lastly, it is literally true that you can succeed best and quickest by helping others to succeed. And I know that I feel that way. I know cohort four feels that way with Professor Garassi helping us succeed. And now we can help our, our students succeed in middle school and high school and eventually in college. So uh, my name is Stuart Tarloff. I'm a teacher at Google Prep. I teach sixth grade. First, before I want to start, I just want to thank uh, Dr. Garassi for our support and leadership throughout the cohort. I'd also like to thank our fellow cohort. I'd like to thank uh, our friends at Lavelle, Widener College, and our supporting staff, and especially Dr. Preskill. So my title over here is Action Project, The Effects of Self-Esteem self on Academic Achievement. So uh, about my education here, I got my undergraduate here in sociology, criminal justice law. I did my master's in 7 through 12 adolescence with uh, content area, social studies, and special ed. And I can never say anything negative about Wagner, all positive things. You know, they really shape you to be successful in your academics and as well as your career. So here's our mission statement of school. And I really just want to focus on mainly three key points here. You know, we put a really big emphasis on rigor. 
Our administration and staff really push for high depth of knowledge. We focus on web staff of, uh, web staff of knowledge to, as a model for our instruction. We really hold the kids to a high expectation and we use it to drive our instruction in the classroom. Relevance. All content, all content areas make the effort and are encouraged to basically make connections with their content to relevant, meaningful topics. And we all know if students are, can make a connection to modern day, you know, they're going to be more engaged in what they're doing. Professional development. Every Wednesday we work together as an entire staff with the purpose of improving our institution and our teaching. And let me tell you, as a first year teacher, it's really helpful and beneficial to you. Teaching standards. So these two standards we focused on in throughout the project. We have uh, principle 11, the teacher understands the politics and ethics of teaching. Really what that spoke to me is being responsible, being responsible for your job and what you have to do to be an educator. And uh, principle 12, teacher utilizes students' diverse cultures as a resource in developing and enacting curriculum. You know, I teach at a very diverse school, and you have to be aware of that, especially not from that type of educational environment. The challenge, to respect students' diverse cultures in the classroom while teaching the required social studies curriculum. Over here I put up my core curriculum. You have the Eastern Hemisphere, Africa, the Middle East, South and East Asia, and Europe. And here are some examples of the type of diverse students we have here. African American, Mexican, Dominican, Ecuadorian, and Spanish. Classroom approach. So I took a couple uh, steps here for my classroom. We have uh, developing meaningful warm-ups. Students can relate to content topics. So for one example, we had them really, uh, when we're looking at the religions of the Middle East, we had them look at the bias of different religions. And that sparked a good uh, conversations. Students brought up things in their own neighborhood and their community that they witnessed among their different uh, differences. Also, relate content <coughs> to relevant issues. Example, discussing the link between the bubonic plague and the AIDS virus. So right now we're covering the Middle Ages. And I showed them an article from the uh, Seattle Times basically saying that individuals who survived during the Black Death, the Black Plague, had this mutation and passed it down to their offspring and it trickled down to people today. And basically having them aware that this mutation made it uh, easier for them to fight off infection. And basically there's a small amount of people today that have a small immunity to the AIDS virus and HIV. So the kids were very interested in it. And when you go over cross discipline with science and social studies, it really helps for uh, engagement. So identify the focus student. So I was doing one of my speeches about high expectation and why it's important to be successful. And one of the, a student who is a very confident student, very articulate, uh, shouted this back at me. What do you expect from us, Mr. Tarloff? We are a bunch of black kids in a private school. So right away when I heard that, and this is coming from 11, 12 year old kids, I was really disheartened as an educator. Now to have that mentality was, was really something like, wow, this is really what I'm up against here. So right away I was like, this is going to be my focus student. So I primarily work with her in social studies, and just for reasons I didn't get uh, permission from their parents, so we'll call her a focus student. So learning goal for student. Make a positive impact on students who lack self-esteem. Increase academic success by providing positive learning experience to increase the positive way the student viewed herself. So a little background on the student. She comes from an ethnically mixed family, African-American, Spanish, Caucasian descent. She has very young parents, probably in the mid to late 20s, which can be a challenge of, of you know, in itself. She lives with her half-brother, mother, and stuff, uh, stepfather. Very capable student, and she's aware of her emotions. So my plan of action. So basically I would meet with her any free time I could, any time I saw her in the hallway, I would give her basically a boost of morale. So I would compliment on her behavior, her intellectual accomplishments. During lunch I would take the opportunity to really sit down and show her things to motivate her. I would share pictures of African American people of our demographic that came from the same area and turned out to be very successful. So once again, taking the time to get to know the student 
building that relationship and motivating her for success. So during my classroom instruction, strategies that work for her, I would call on her first at the beginning of each class to encourage her to communicate her thoughts and compliment her for her sharing. So I use a Socratic method. I always like to ask questions. So I would start with an open-ended question and have the students comment and build off each other and facilitating it back to the focus student and myself. So basically what I would do here, her comments that she would make would involve other students and they would reflect upon what she was saying and it would create a very much engaged learning environment. So having her feel empowered and increasing engagement throughout the entire classroom. Resources I used for my practice, last spirit of love, power, and freedom, and fun. The focus primarily on student empowerment. Showing the students pictures and telling stories of a successful African-American woman. The folk student had miles of success. Showing them there's people to look up to, even though they're not right around you, but they're there. The student began to feel better about herself and bullied other students less. Sometimes the student was a bully. And as she started to improve and build self-esteem and confidence, I noticed that declined almost 100%. Love. By engaging her in discussions in the classroom, the other students would respond positively to her increasing her self-esteem. So by her being a leader, by her speaking up and having these meetings, her self-esteem was growing and it was affecting her throughout her academics and her interactions with other kids. So looking at the data, in the first marking period, she started off okay, around that 70, 80 range. You know, and this was the first quarter. So as students get, you know, they build a relationship, they feel more comfortable, you know, they start to slack off a little bit. So she dropped significantly from about an 80 to right down to 70%. And then I noticed things of not being motivated, not uh, no sense of community, and that's right around, around then when I identified her as the focused student. And then I see a significant jump in the third quarter from a 70 to an 88, almost a 90. And as of right now, we did our progress reports, she's around an 85. So you can see academic growth from the first and second quarter to the uh, third and fourth quarter. So my reflection, my takeaway, I realize that positive reinforcement and personal time with student really goes a long way. You know, setting the time to make the student feel like they're loved or empowered, like they're special, really contributes to class engagement and to results uh, in data wise. Instruction, children of diverse cultures benefit from content they relate to, which is so true. Anytime you can relate something to their community, to what they know, what's on TV, much better conversation and much, much better levels of engagement. Classroom environment. Generating interesting discussion reduces the need for classroom management. It stimulates respect among students and lessens the occurrence of bullying. Every time they're engaged, you have less problems. They're in their seats, they're active, and they want to shine academically.
Thank you for your patience. I have about two minutes. <laughs> All right. Um, my uh, research is called Nine to Five, and it uh, is based on encouraging responsibility to positively positively affect academic achievement. And I named it Nine to Five because our school day at Lavelle Prep is very long, and uh, the first period starts right before nine o'clock, and we leave at four thirty. Um, I also wanted my students to um, enhance their skills that would help them in the work uh, in the workplace, which a lot of people refer to as nine to five. And it's also the name of a musical, and I'm a drama teacher, so <laughs> wrap that up. So a little bit about me. I graduated from Petrides in uh, 2007 with my friend Erica, and then together we both graduated uh, here at Wagner in 2011. Uh, with a degree in childhood education, uh, general ed and special ed, and I concentrated in theater, thinking I would never get a job as a drama teacher, but uh, thanks to Dr. Preskill, he uh, uh, helped me meet Ms. Finn, uh, the principal of Lavelle Prep, and I became Mr. Reynolds Coppolis, the seventh grade drama teacher. <laughs> The standards I focused on were principles number five and six, which were to understand individual and group motivation and behavior to create a learning environment that encourages positive social interaction, engagement in learning, and self-motivation, and knowledge of effective verbal, nonverbal, and communication techniques to foster activity, inquiry, collaboration, and supportive interaction in the classroom. So what these really meant to me were I wanted my students to be motivated without me having to push them. I wanted them to come in the room and to know what was expected of them because these are, uh, these are life skills that would help them in the workplace and I uh, wanted them to almost look at me as their boss. So my challenge was to use individual and group motivation techniques to develop a learning environment where students grow in assuming responsibility for themselves just like they would have to in the real world. So to solve my challenge, I decided to give my students uh, jobs that they would have to complete that would provide them with both a sense of freedom and responsibility. And with these jobs, I hope to enhance the following skills, which were collaboration, supportive uh, interaction with classmates, self-motivation, and active engagement. So the jobs I created, I wanted them to to uh, enhance all of these life skills that they would need when they got into the workplace. And I decided to create uh, theater-related uh, jobs, like stage crew, who would clean the room for me, playwright, who would write the notes on the board, stage manager, who would hand out the snacks, a producer, who would write passes for students to leave the room, director, who would um, run errands for me, director's assistant, who would uh, give out the handouts, and the critic who would do the point system at the end of the day. So really, if I had someone to teach a lesson, I probably wouldn't even have to come into work. <laughs> so, I, to measure the success, I used our point system at Lavelle Prep, which is a point system where the students earn five points each class period. These points also turn into pennies and uh, money, and then they can go and use all these points at the point store and buy cool things. The five points are on time, on task, in seat, listening, and considerate, and prepared. 